This is TomorrowPictures.tv. I don't mind at all being called that. I think that we're living in a society that, uh, to a large extent, is pop. I think it's one of the facets of, of our society, and it's one of the facets of the present society which is new, and one of the facets that, that hasn't existed before. But it's made, in a way, partially a new landscape for us in the way of, of billboards and uh, neon signs and all of the stuff that we're very familiar with, and uh, also literature and uh, television, radio. So that almost all of the um, landscape, all of our environment seems to be made up partially of a desire to, to sell products. Um, this is the landscape that I'm interested in portraying, and I'm also not only portraying it, but I'm working in the style of it, or uh, a style which at least parodies the style of everyday art and everyday society. I'm interested in portraying uh, a sort of anti-sensibility that pervades the society and uh, a kind of uh, maybe gross oversimplification. I'm, I use that more as style than as actuality. I re really don't think that art can be uh, gross and oversimplified and, and remain uh, art. I mean, it must have subtleties and it must have it must uh, sort of yield to a kind of uh, aesthetic unity, otherwise it's not uh, uh, in the realm of art, it's something else probably. But I think that uh, using it as a style, I think it gives it a kind of brutality and maybe hostility uh, that is useful to me in an aesthetic way. I don't mean that, that industrialization is attempting to be hostile, that's not the point, but um, the, the, the aggressiveness is aggressive to the point of hostility, I think, and it's this kind of thing which can, um, which I think forms or crystallizes into a, a kind of style, and um, it's that the sort of anti-sensibilities anti and conceptual appearance of the work that interests me and um, is my subject matter. sensibility that I'm trying to bring to it is apparent anti-sensibility, but it is a new sensibility. I think that's the important part of it. It's not, probably not so much that um, it is apparent anti-sensibility, but it's a new sensibility. It's a modern sensibility instead, say, of thick and thin paint, which might be the European sensibility. Uh, I'm using flat areas of color as opposed to dotted areas, which uh, imitate bend a dots in printing and become an industrialized texture rather than what we're familiar with as a paint texture. Uh, so that by juxtaposing two kind of commercial textures together, I'm, I'm really involved in a relationship between texture in this instance, as well as color and the other things, uh, but that it's a modern industrial texture and it's not uh, one that is nostalgic. Uh, or that ref uh, refers back to uh, European painting or American painting up to now. I'm rather careful not to, ha to get the painting textured or to have it look worked on and rearranged. I, I try to do it so that it appears as though this was only done once and that I knew exactly what I was going to do uh, right from the start and it was just sort of a question of filling in the lines. But uh, paintings uh, rarely work out this way and generally take some kind of rearranging. Uh, but I, I sort of work it out almost in a mechanical way uh, to begin with. Uh, I think that whatever uh, approach one uses, that he ought to go as far as he can with it in order to make it have as much impact as possible. And I think the one that I've chosen seems to lead toward a kind of... Uh, brutal and antiseptic quality. So since I'm working in this area, I would try to push that style as far as I can. I have worked in other ways and at any time tried to push um, the feeling, whatever feeling it was I had, uh, just as far as I could in the painting. 
Most of the painting that I've done is sort of a matte finish. That's one kind of industrial texture, but I, I kind of got interested in very glossy surfaces, which would uh, be even more sanitary, I think, and remind one of um, sort of hospital corridors or lunch counters or whatnot. I've used this Rolox plastic uh, because it has a three-dimensional quality. Uh, surface is reticulated and forms sort of a lens whereby um, with a change of light or a change of movement, the background will, will seem to change. And um, it seemed to lend itself very well to landscapes because it's reminiscent of the sky, which would change, but it's also reminiscent of a kind of commercial handling of uh, sky. It might be a way to make a, a beautiful sky that would stop your eye as you went by a store. So it has a kind of commercial aspect as well as a, a beautiful one. But it also, plastics themselves being uh, modern materials and uh, associated with industry and so forth, and not <laughs> reminiscent of past art, I found very uh, sympathetic to my own use, and I've used them uh, pretty much for landscapes. I started uh, to try to do paintings in epoxy paint and had difficulty working with it. The idea occurred to me that I could have them uh, porcelain enameled on steel as the uh, subway signs are, are made. So I tried to find a factory that would work along with me, and um, the idea of getting into an industrial process itself was interesting to me. Then from this, uh, we found that we could easily make uh, three-dimensional objects, uh, which I could fabricate in cardboard and make um, two-dimensional plans on paper, and the factory would execute these. Most of these were explosions, although some were landscapes. Then I got interested in uh, doing things in fully round, because uh, these three-dimensional uh, enamels are essentially two-dimensional, and uh, look for some way of doing my uh, image in ceramic. The idea of doing it in ceramic and in three dimensions was particularly interesting to me because the symbols that I use are used uh, to give three dimensional effect on a two dimensional surface. Uh, shadows and uh, lighting that you see in cartooning and in advertisements usually depict the kind of uh, light reflection or shiny surface which tries to make the two dimensional image look uh, round. Um, well, let, let's imagine an ad in which uh, cups and saucers are being advertised. And on the surface of these in the newspaper, we have light and shade, which is depicted in, in either flat black marks or in half-tone dots. Uh, and these half-tone dots uh, represent three dimensions. But to put these half-tone dots and these same two-dimensional symbols on an actual three-dimensional surface and to make a cartooned image, the symbols of which seem to be associated, let's say, with a flat, working, two-dimensional surface, was something that interests me quite a bit. Also, the idea of doing, say, a sculpture of cups and saucers in the same material that cups and saucers are done in, in other words, ceramic, was another uh, thing which interested me quite a bit. The heads are a little bit of a different problem because the original heads are not in ceramic. It was another, in a sense, excuse for decorating a surface but a kind of interesting uh, one to me, and one that sometimes get into amusing contradictions between what is two-dimensional and what is three-dimensional. It's very hard to say why I started to do um, cartooning. I, I, I began again in 1960, 61, to paint uh, cartoons in, still involved in a kind of abstract expressionist format of painting, using uh, human, uh, humorous sort of animated uh, or animal cartoons like Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny and things. Uh, the paintings I don't think were successful at all, and I've destroyed most of those uh, paintings. Uh, but in '61, uh, got the idea of trying of doing one fairly straight, where there was where the painterliness which had been in my abstract expressionist paintings was no longer part of the painting and the kind of texture that I would use would be the commercial texture of uh, half-tone dots and flat uh, printed areas. I go through comic books looking for material which seems uh, to hold possibilities for painting both in its uh, visual impact and in the impact of its written message, which I rarely make up. I don't think I'd be capable of making them up. Um, well, I try to take messages which uh, are a little, which kind of universal, or in a way either 
completely meaningless or so involved that, that um, they become ludicrous. Uh, when I did it, I had no idea that anyone would be interested. In fact, I, I really felt uh, as though no one in the world would look at these because they, they were certainly humorous and, and um, I was serious about them as paintings, but certainly recognized the kind of, um, uh, oh, recognized how other people would see these works. I know that my work has been accused of looking like the um, things that I copy, and it certainly does look like the things I copy. And I think a lot of this is that uh, people assume that similar things are identical. But it is that quality, whatever art is, that um, transforms um, the work of art to be something different from the subject matter. And uh, I believe I'm transforming this into something else or at least that I'm forming art. Uh, there's no way to prove this. Earlier, you said casually, since I don't believe in painting anymore. Uh, well, I, I don't believe in painting because I hate objects, and uh, uh, I, I hate to go to museums and see pictures of the wall because they look so important and they don't really mean anything. People think of you as the, uh, the the perfect pop artist, without really knowing what that means, mm -hmm. or I think really knowing what your work is about. I'd like to try to talk some more about the paintings and the things you did earlier, uh, because there's something that I think needs to be explained for the public, which has at this point a certain impression of you, and I'm not sure that it's the one that you would want them to have, although I don't think it matters to you very much. Is that true? What? D does it matter to you that people feel one way or another to you? I mean, you have a kind of reputation now, which is a little bit apart from, from what you really are, I think. And does it matter to you that this is so, that they feel one way rather than another about you? Uh, oh, I, I don't really understand. What, what, what do you mean? Uh, this is like sitting... Um, uh, at the World's Fair, you know, riding one of those Ford machines where the voice is behind you. It's so exciting. You don't have to think anything. But you should just tell me the words and I can just repeat them because I can't... Uh, uh, it's... Uh, I can't... I'm, I can't, I'm so empty today, I can't think of anything. Why don't you just tell me the words and they'll just come out of my mouth. No, don't worry about it because... No, no, I think it'd be so nice. But we'll... We'll loosen <laughs> we'll come we'll come we'll up after a while. Well, uh, no, it's not that. It's just I can't... Um, I have a cold and I can't... Uh, okay. Uh, think of anything. And it'd be so nice if you told me a sentence. Uh, let me ask repeat. you some questions that you can answer. Oh, no, but you repeat the answers, too. All right. Well, I don't know the answer well, to some of Well, you... You, 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 before you started the silk screen, you made a number of paintings and you made comic strips, right? Uh... Oh, yes, I guess I made comic strips uh, before I did uh, the, the, uh, the silk screen things. And you made some other paintings of things that and were I not made, done mechanically. What were they? I made, uh, I guess they were ads in magazines. And then you made... Uh, and then I made... Uh, things like... Things like, uh, uh, reticence about himself masks a unique sensibility, one which has helped to alter our vision of the contemporary world. He suppresses his own feelings. This comes naturally to him, but also it imposes a detachment which gives his work an objective, almost surgical clarity. In time, he arrived at the silkscreen technique of making his pictures, a method which completely removes his own hand from the paintings. Choosing the images, their scale and shape, he sends them off to be processed photomechanically. Only the choice of color remains. In the factory, as everyone calls his studio, he prints the paintings with the help of his assistant, poet Gerard Malanga.
Like Lichtenstein, Warhol takes his images from commercial art and from the popular culture, focusing on the most banal and familiar components of our environment. Warhol's intention is not satirical. With an implacable coolness, he forces our attention on the bizarre inventory of package labels, movie stars, and news photos of disasters, things we never really look at. By blowing up their scale, treating them so mechanically and passively, and often monotonously repeating them within the same painting, he rides over our indifference and our blindness. We have no other choice but to open our eyes anew to the whole world around us. A lot of people might be inclined, it seems to me, to, to put you down because they could say that your work has a certain distance. It's mechanical and, and you don't really make it and all of those things. And yet, like everyone else, when you start to talk about it, the things you say are about really caring. I mean, you want people's lives to be um, better. Um, yeah, well, I guess I, I really don't... Uh, it's too hard to care, and I guess I, I, I well, I, I care, I still care, but I mean, it would be so much nice not to care. Uh, you, in other words, are you saying that, that you want to, you are involved in this idea of, of making people more conscious of their lives, but you don't really want to get into, into their lives deeply, you just uh, want to stir up? Oh, yes, yeah. Don't want to get too involved. I think that, uh, that, uh, this is a, a very important thing about all of your work. I mean, this idea of the, own, the distance, your own distance that you keep from it. Is this because of this feeling that you don't want to get that close to it? Uh, I, yes, I don't want to get too close to it. You never in any of your work have ever really said anything that tells anyone anything about you, and you don't want that to happen, do you? Uh, well, there's not very much to say about, you know, about me. But there have been some extraordinary things. I think that for me, the, uh, the, the high point was the opening of the exhibition at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, uh -huh. when uh, so many uh -huh. people came that they had to take all the pictures down, and thousands of people jammed in there, and there were no pictures to speak of, just you. And uh, you had the, the real character of a celebrity there kind of celebrity you really haven't had in American art. Do you realize that? Oh, it was, it was so very really glamorous. Well, Andy, do you, do you have any thoughts at all about uh, the fact that so many people like the idea of just being able to watch you sitting in a chair or standing on a balcony selling oh, soup uh, cans? Uh, oh, but that, that won't last very, very long. You don't think so? No. Which is, you know, uh, because uh, uh, just sitting there, um, it's really doesn't mean anything, but uh, what I really want to do is, I guess, do some movies and, uh, and sort of take what we've done and combine them together or something like that. Andy Warhol has turned his attention more and more to movies, and he has become a leader of the underground film movement. He violates all the conventions of filmmaking, and his movies are shown without editing as they come from the lab. While some run for eight hours, most of them are short, three-minute reels, like the 13 Most Beautiful Women. The film you are watching, Nancy Worthington Fish, comes from this series. Stars, Edie Sedgwick talks about her impressions of Andy. Andy has an extraordinary sort of removed self. I mean, he loves to see everything and watch everything and has all this uh, sort of beautiful imagination and, and also very steady, s severe vision. Severe in the sense that it's unrelenting. It doesn't change. But it's like ideal because it's, what he's doing is 
he just gives back the simplest things to people. And then all of a sudden, um, see what has been in front of them. It's like, uh, he sure has a, a touch for that. And his genius, his self, he really is a person. And he's, he's an artist. very simply uh, without moving the camera and so on and now you've tended to make them more and more complicated uh, you're getting you're getting into sound now and uh, what, what are you trying to do now uh, well I uh, just uh, well I got tired of just setting the camera because uh, it just means that repeating the uh, same idea over again so I'm changing the uh, I'm trying to see what else the camera can do. And I'm mostly concerned with uh, doing bad camera work and, uh, uh, and we're trying to make it so bad, but doing it well. Where, um, where the most important thing is happening, you seem to miss it all the time. Or show the most scratches you can on the film or all the dirt you can get on the film uh, or uh, zoom badly where you zoom and you hit the most important you miss the most important thing and uh, your camera jiggles uh, so that everybody knows you're watching a film because everybody else can do I don't know, it's so easy to do movies and you can uh, uh, just um, shooting every picture really comes out right. So uh, and that's what I'm working on right now. I want to change the subject again. Um, and I would like to ask you to say something about the new sculpture. Uh, oh, the new things well, I'm working on are, are, are is, is sculpture because uh, 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 since I didn't want to paint anymore and I thought uh, that I could give that up and, and do the movies and then I thought well there must be a way that I have to finish it off and I thought the only way is, is to make a painting that floats and I asked Billy Kluver to help me make a painting that floats and he um, uh, thought about it and he came up with the, uh, the uh, silver since he knew I like silver he thought of the silver things that I'm working on now and and the idea is to uh, uh, fill them with helium and let them out of your window and they'll float away and that's one less object to have around. And, and it's the, uh, well, it would be, it's the way of finishing our painting and... and so you, you think that, um, that this will finish off painting and then... Well, for me, yes. For you. So you feel that, that uh, instead of having a painting, which is an inert object hanging on the wall, that what we really need is to have things which involve people more directly and... Uh, oh, oh we, uh, we started having... We're sponsoring a new band. It's called The Velvet Underground. And, uh, and we're trying to... When, since I don't really believe in painting anymore, I thought it would be a nice way of combining, uh, and we have this chance to combine music and, and art and uh, uh, films all together, and, uh, and we're sort of working on that, and, and uh, well, the whole thing is being auditioned tomorrow at 9 o'clock, and if it works out, it might be very glamorous. What sort of thing do you intend to do with the band? Could you uh, talk about that? Well, it would be a, a, a kind of a the biggest discotheque in the world and it will have 21 screens and I don't know, three or four bands. <laughs>
Tomorrow Pictures. The story is in the telling.